Uh, we're getting word here, and we mentioned before a few more details. The Energy Secretary, Rick Perry, is going to meet uh, with the Russian oil minister, so kind of his counterpart next week uh, in Washington. Uh, they're discussing oil and presumably uh, efforts to bring down those prices. Remember, it was the president a couple of weeks back who had urged OPEC to increase production to bring down uh, prices that he had urged at the time, maybe a million uh, barrels a day to increase production. This accord that was uh, sort of written off on by OPEC members today increases it by a little less than that, about 600,000 barrels. And that is why, among other things, uh, oil prices are rising and oil stocks are more than holding uh, their own. Uh, to America First Policy Advisor Dan Eberhardt on what he makes of all of this and, and what this could portend. Dan, very good to have you. Uh, thank you for having me back. So, uh, so what do you see happening ahead. here? Well, what I what I think the story is here is that the the 600 to 700 thousand barrel uh, increase that was agreed to today, I think, is a little bit is pretty much a mild uh, a mild tonic here. So the worldwide demand increased a million seven barrels last year. This year, the projection is a million four increase. So I really think a, a six to seven hundred thousand barrel a day increase is, is really not even going to mop up the additional demand created this year. And so I think it portends a, a tighter market and, and flat to rising oil prices. You think they anticipated that and they're okay with it? Uh, I, I, I think they did anticipate it. I think they're, they're a little bit not okay with it, but I think Iran has been dragging its heels. You know, really o, OPEC is a tale of two cities. You've got Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait that have more capacity and then kind of Russia over on the side. But most of the rest of OPEC don't have any additional capacity they can add right now. And then you've got production uh, falling precipitously in Venezuela, in Libya, and in Algeria. So talk has been the only thing that reverse this in a, in a world where demand is, is beating out supply is if a trade war comes and all of a sudden that doesn't happen. That's a, that's a hard imponderable to look at right now because it isn't happening. But, but what do you make of that? Yeah, so I, I think a little bit these guys have got to think maybe more fourth dimensionally than in the past. I think we've got a good kind of synchronized world growth right now. But I think if you look at the, the, all the trade friction uh, that, that President Trump is leading, I think that that could potentially destabilize, you know, the economic growth. And that could push the demand growth down. And then maybe you've got a little bit uh, more balance in the oil markets and, and the guidance would be a little more flat to down. Are you surprised uh, that when we number. had the uptick in gas prices, Dan, that it didn't lead to a freeze or even a slowdown in SUV and, and gas guzzler sales, for want of a better term, that either Americans can deal with this or they think this will pass over or they're, they're fine? Uh, well, I think it's, it's really much more correlated to, you know, how they're feeling in their pocketbook, overall yeah. consumer sentiment, and, their, and their, you know, whether their uh, personal income is going up matters a little bit more than the actual price of gasoline in terms of what's correlated to what. So the, the fundamentals still favor strong prices? Uh, I, I think so. You know, look, in, in uh, 2015, 16, and 17, the capital investment in the oil and gas industry was about half what it was in 12, 13, and 14. And it's still not back. And then you've got demand growth through the bust and then continuing uh, into 17 and 18. So. I think that portends a tighter market and, and oil rising in the medium term. Dan, thank you very, very much. Good read on things. Dan Eberhardt, uh, the Canary LLC CEO.